welcome to the latest installment of My Dad Listens to This. I'm Juliet the Daughter. And as ever, I'm Kevin the Dad. And this week, we are talking about Angel with a Lariat by Katie Lang and her band, The Reclines. So, Dad, what do we need to know? Okay, so first off, Katie Lang spells her name in lowercase. Yep. She was inspired by poet E.E. E. Cummings, who did the same thing. Mm -hmm. Okay, Catherine Dawn Lang was born November 2nd, 1961 in Edmonton, Alberta. She was first drawn to music whilst a student at Red Dare College. She became acquainted with Patsy Cline while preparing to star in a theatrical college theatrical production based on the late singer's life. Oh. Patsy died in a plane crash in March of 1963. What is it with plane crashes? I don't know, but it seems to be the way to go if you're a singer. Mm. Um, Katie, or helicopters. Katie immersed herself in Cline's life and music and decided to pursue a career as a professional singer. Along with guitarist songwriter Ben Mink, they formed the Reclines, a Patsy Cline tribute band. They recorded the single Friday Dance Promenade, or Promenade, uh, which got good indie reviews. They signed to Larry Wanagas's label Bumstead and released A Truly Western Experience in 1984. It got good reviews, and Katie and the Reclines got national exposure in Canada. She and the band were labeled Cowpunk. <laughs> now, I like it. Cowpunk is kind of a slippery label. It's about as easy to pin down as Mercury. Couldn't they go like Cowboy Punk or something else like well, that? Well, yeah, I mean, that's what it was called first. Cowboy Punk, you shorten it to Cowpunk. Oh. <laughs> um, it was created to define music that was punk but had a country tinge to it. And a lot of bands fell under the cowpunk umbrella. X, The Violent Femmes, The Blasters, Lone Justice, The Long Riders, and even Rhode Island's own Rubber Rodeo. What about uh, The Cramps? But that's more psychopunk and rockabilly. Psychobilly, yeah. Yeah, psychobilly. Yeah, see... It's it getting weird. It's getting be, weird yeah. now. Yeah. Yeah, it's like rockabilly, punk. Yeah, it just it's just tough to define maybe also it's like whatever the band wants to be called call them that yeah and basically you know if your lead singer had some sort of twang in their voice you know cowpunk yeah basically <laughs> or if you mentioned something about horses or whatever anyway some of these bands would later become associated with alt country or roots rock or americana which we basically briefly touched on when we did our band episode there's so many terms holy crap yeah i know i know okay can, can we just talk about the terms for a second yeah sure are the people who come up with them like snobs or is it the fans who come up with them or the bands or, like a combination of all the above where they need to like label a sound so it's easier for people to understand what this band is and what they're doing they are probably more music critics too okay so. I mean, because I think a lot of bands, it's like, they don't care. It's just, you know, this is what we play and we're playing it. So sit the hell down and shut the hell up. I'm sure there's some bands who didn't like the labels that they got, though, because it probably pigeonholed them into one thing. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. Anyway. Okay. Back to Katie. So she would win her first Juno Award in 1985. Like, think Canadian Grammys. Mm. For most promising female vocalist. Oh, no. And what did Katie do when she won? Um, I don't know. She made a list of promises about what she would and wouldn't do in the future, thus fulfilling the title of most promising. What do you mean? Oh, she... promises. Yeah. Promises, promises. Oh, that's another episode. Yeah. Um, she signed with Sire Records in 1986, and her major label debut, Angel with a Lariat, came out in July of 1987. Dave Edmonds produced, and the album did well on college radio and cutting-edge country stations. You would mix Dave Edmonds, right? I, no. Oh, sorry. That's Dave Stewart. Oops. This is Dave Edmonds, Dave Edmonds, and Nick Lowe rock pile, which... Oh, okay. We might do something. We'll get to them at some point. Yep. Yeah, which I never even knew that there was something called cutting-edge country stations. Go figure. <laughs> um, it was a hit in Canada, but more of an underground hit in the U.S., Nashville really wasn't sure what to make of her. Oh. Um, while she was recording her second album, Shadowland, she recorded a duet with Roy Orbison on Roy's hit Crying. It was used in the 1987 movie Hiding Out. Now, Roy and Katie would go on to win a Grammy for Best Country Collaboration with Vocals Aww. in 1989. That's sweet. Which, that could only be a Grammy category. <laughs> um, meanwhile, back in 1988, Katie released her first solo album, the aforementioned Shadowland. 
which was an album of Country Torch songs produced by Patsy Cline's producer, Owen Bradley. Oh, wow. She performed at the closing ceremonies for the Winter Olympics in Calgary, Alberta, mm -hmm. and she also sang background vocals along with Jennifer Warnes and Bonnie Raitt for Roy Orbison's special, A Night in Black and White. I, I still got to watch that at some point. We have it on DVD still, right? Or did you donate it? <laughs> I don't know. Oh, no. <laughs> I, I don't know. I'd have to check the draw. Okay. Yes, we still have DVDs. Yeah, um, absolutely. In, in 1989, She and the Reclines released Absolute Torch and Twang, which is considered their best album. It would also be their last with Katie officially going solo. Katie would win a Grammy for Best Female Country Vocal Performance for the album. She hit the road, and I saw her at PPAC. Oh, how was she? She was great. Uh, but she did have a confession to make to us in the audience. She'd never heard of Rhode Island before. No, that she was a... Lesbian? A vegetarian. Oh. And when she made that confession, I yelled out, No! <laughs> did she laugh? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> but she would come out as a lesbian in 1992, and she said it was easier for her to come out as a lesbian than a vegetarian in the country music world because, you know, cattle ranching and steak and barbecue and beef and all that sort of thing. Okay, because that's interesting. Because like, can I talk about country music like a little bit? So I found this post, I think it might have been on Tumblr, where it's like the early days of rock and roll, like Johnny Cash, Tennessee, Ernie Ford. Most of them are about um, labor men, labor unions, labor struggles, working against the man. Yeah. Then, you know, you get Dolly Parton and Reba McIntyre, and it's about women's liberation and feminism. Then... I'm not making this up. 9-11 happens, and you basically get America, yeah, and that's what country music has been ever since. So I find that interesting that you said, what, she came out in 1992? Yep. Which, on one hand, you know, there's still a lot of progression to be made with LGBTQ rights. In the 90s, things were getting better, but not by a whole heck of a lot. And you realize that if Katie Lang came out now in a post 9-11 country world, she would have gotten so much more shit from those fans, especially being, you know, a lesbian and also being Asian. They probably would have made some racist remarks, too. Hmm. Yeah. Prob probably. Food for thought. Oh, speaking of food, her Meat Stinks campaign went up Alberta, <laughs> Canada's butt sideways <laughs> with 30 stations in the province banning her songs. Yeah, my friend Jaden says that Alberta in Canada is basically like their version of Alabama and Mississippi. It kind of, yeah. Red yeah. territory and racist as hell. <laughs> Sorry, Canada, but that's what my friends say who live there. And it is kind of Western Canada, I think. Yeah, it's yeah. like Canada's boonies. Yeah, pr pretty much. Mm -hmm. Um... Her next album, 1992's Ingenue, was not country at all. It was her most successful album, and she won a Grammy for Best Female Pop Vocal Performance for the song <laughs> Constant Craving, which actually made Billboard's Top 40 chart. Yay! Constant Craving also led to the Rolling Stones giving her and Ben Mink songwriting credits for their 1997 song Anybody see my baby? That's fascinating. Because their chorus says, oh, Cori? Whatever. Are so similar. Mick and Keith said they had never, ever heard the song Constant Craving before and were flummoxed. Flummoxed, I say, as to how it could have happened. I think someone pointed it out to them and they were saying, we have no idea what this song is. We've never heard it. And then, this, and then Mick discovered. His daughter had listened to Constant Craving on her stereo a lot. There we go. And he realized he had heard the song a lot, but subliminally, like, you know, walking by his kid's room, you know, getting his cup of coffee or... Not paying any attention, tuning yeah, it out. Yeah, and it just kind of seeped in. It's osmosis, really. Yeah. Yeah. So, to avoid lawsuits, <laughs> the Ebenezer Scrooge of rock and roll gave Katie and Ben credit because he said it was cheaper to give them credit than to, you know wind up in court. I mean, they had to get money from that, though, didn't they? Oh, yeah. Yeah, so yeah. that's Rolling Stones money. That's good money. <laughs> yeah, and I believe, I could be wrong, I believe that was their last top 40 hit. Oh, jeez. Well, the I'll, Rolling have to, Stones. I'll have to do anyway. some research as to whether or not Ghost Town was a top 40 hit for them, that song that they wrote during COVID, which you said was, well, when they when they still want to, they can still do they it. They still can, yep, yep. Yep. Okay, then it was movie time. Yep. Katie and Ben wrote all the songs, and Katie sang them all 
for the movie Even Cowgirls Get the Blues. Movie critic Leonard Maltin said it was the best part of the movie. Oh. Yeah. Aww. It did not get the world's best reviews. Backhanded compliment, really. Yeah, it was based on the um, book by um, Tom Robbins. And they said everyone said the book was a lot better. Oh, that's sad. Anyway, Katie also sang a cover of Skylark for Midnight in the Garden of Good and Evil and sang the song Surrender over the closing credits to the James Bond movie Tomorrow Never Dies. Ooh. One of the Pierce Brosnan ones. And by the way, Sheryl Crow did the song for the opening credits. And we got to talk about her in Disney? Who? Katie Lang. Oh. Um, you can if you want well, I'll to. Mention it in the next, I'll mention it in the next song and then you'll remember. Okay. In 1996, she was made an Officer of the Order of Canada, which is the country's second highest honor after the Order of Merit. British knighthood, basically. It is a pecking order, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, she's put out more albums since, including a number of cover albums. Drag, which is songs about... Drag. Smoking. Oh. Taking a drag from a cigarette. Gotcha. Hymns from the 49th Parallel, songs written by fellow Canadians... Looking at you, Neil Young, and Joni Mitchell, and Bruce Coburn. Nothing wrong with them. Nope. And The Wonderful World, on which she mm -hmm. teamed up with the late, great Tony Bennett, mm -hmm. singing songs associated with Louis Armstrong. Mm -hmm. it, and it won a Grammy for something called Best Traditional Pop Vocal Album. Where the hell do they come up with these category names? Grammys are like, everyone gets a trophy. You get a Grammy. You get a Grammy. <laughs> everyone I, gets a Grammy. I think I even have a Grammy somewhere. Probably, yeah. Grammy for best listening to music in general. <laughs> Our podcast has a Grammy. <laughs> and then um, Tony and uh, Katie hit the road and did the tour together. Yep, they did a lot together. Yep. Um, she's also had two best ofs. Rhino's great named Reincarnation. I like that a lot. I do too. <laughs> which focuses on the Reclines albums and Recollection, which was available as one. And two disc versions. In 2021, Nonsuch Records put out, believe it or not, a dance mix collection, yes, called Makeover. Uh, does it work? I will talk about that a little later. Okay. Uh, she was inducted into the Canadian Music Hall of Fame in 2023. Good for her. She's been eligible for the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame since 2009. Should she get in? I don't know. Yeah, it's I'd hard. say no. It's nothing against her. Could she get into the Our Country Music Hall of Fame if we have one? Oh, oh yeah, there is one. Um, I don't know because there are those who say that the country music years was nothing but performance art. Oh, yeah. And people also say like uh, American country music fans, not all of them, but some people are very hostile to people who do country music that aren't from the United States. Keith Urban being an example of that. Who's this Australian boy think he is? Yeah, yeah. Shania Twain, mm -hmm. who kind of veered more into pop. Yeah. Um, but I don't find anything wrong with it. I mean, if you like country music and you want to do country music, do, do it. country music. Yeah, we won't judge you. The hardcore fans might, but we won't care. Yeah. And see, anyway... Canada gets it right because it's a music hall of fame. Not yep. a specific kind of... So anyone can get in there. <laughs> yeah, Weird Al could get... Well, I don't know. Maybe he could get in there. Maybe. I mean, it's all music. If he changes his citizenship. Anyway, her last album... He might not, though, because of Don't Want to Be a Canadian Idiot. I just realized. Oh, Continue. Okay. <laughs> her last album came out in 2016 called Case Lang Veers on which she teamed up with Nico Case and Laura Veers. Mm -hmm. In 2019, she announced that she was semi-retired, mm -hmm. just not feeling the urge to, to make music whatsoever. But you never know. Maybe she just wants a break. Because she did appear on the killer song Lightning Fields in 2020. And also that year, in pre-COVID February, she performed at Firefight Australia in Sydney, oh. which I think they had, like, bushfires going out of control. Oh, Yeah. Now, as for me, I remember seeing an ad for her in Billboard magazine when she had first come out with um, Angel Little Lariat. And that ad was interesting enough to make me ask a former Canadian pen pal if she had any of Katie's stuff. She didn't, but her friend Andy did. And he made me a tape, because it was the 1980s, mm -hmm. of a truly Western experience. And I liked it and picked up Angel Little Lariat. Now, Angel clocks in around 31 minutes. Not too bad. Not too bad at all. In and out. Um, 
Say what you got to say. Keep it catchy. Move on. Uh, Dave Edmonds produced it. And whilst doing research, I came across some reviews that said his production overwhelmed Katie's voice, except for the last song, Three Cigarettes in an Ashtray. But I personally don't hear it that way because I'm used to, like, Dave Edmonds stuff. With Nick Lowe? Yeah, yeah. and Solo. Um, and he's produced other people, um, like Stray Cats. Mm -hmm. um, but like I said, I don't hear it that way, but apparently KD and Ben Mink, Mink did because when Rhino put together Reincarnation, they remixed the songs from Angel with Lariat to get rid of the echo. Everything sounds very clear on those remixes, and to me, it kind of sounds sterile because it's like, you know, how on rock and roll, how on punk. Did not the Rolling Stones teach us make the choruses clear, but the verses not so much? Mm -hmm. Plus, Dave Edmonds' use of Echo gives the album a certain feel that the reincarnation remixes just don't capture. I can't put my finger on it, but it's one of those things like, I know it when I hear it. I think he was true to, like, the early rock and roll sound. I mean, this, is lab this album is labeled as cowpunk, but you could almost label it rockability. Yeah, you could. Early rock and roll, whatever, whatever you want to call it. Mm -hmm. It definitely has that feel to it. So let's dive into the songs themselves. First song, Turn Me Round. When I first heard this, I thought, Katie Lang? Because I was so used to her being in Tony Bennett land, so I wasn't expecting rock at all. Then the fiddle kicked in, and I thought, oh, this is why Disney got her to sing Patch of Heaven in Home on the Range. Remember that one? Well, Jess and Andrew did, so you don't have to. And they are going to kill me for making that reference, but I don't care. That was the one with the with the cows, right? That was the one with the cows. That we saw, and that was like allegedly their last hand-drawn cartoon. Yeah, and no, Princess and the Frog might have been, I think. But it's also hilarious because the villain in that movie, Alameda Slim, originally it want, they wanted it to end with the villain storming the Capitol, which, you know, nowadays we'd be like, eh. Anyway, this song is the definition of a rip-roaring good time with the music chorus effects are placed on the voice that i thought this was dave stewart the whole time so i was like this sounds kind of like you're the mix and katie's voice just roars with a big sound that shows she's having fun mm -hmm. and in the music video everyone is dancing and having a ball but juliet you may ask yourself why were we taught square dancing in schools in the first place well loyal listeners once upon a time henry ford yes that henry ford hated jazz and black people so much, he wanted to replace it with square dancing and fiddles as he felt, quote, the devil's music was causing a moral decay in American culture. So he poured money into American public schools to have the gym classes teach square dancing. The end. But man, if they played this, I would have gotten a sense of rhythm way sooner. What a great opener to say, buckle up, we're going to sing and get you on your feet. I don't know how I can possibly follow that. Yeah, I know. But I will try anyway. <laughs> so last night, last night, last just night? Like, yeah, last night itself, last Friday night, last night, Katie heard a ruckus down the road. She checks it out, and it's a square dance like a rock and rodeo. Mm -hmm. That's all there is to the song, pretty much. Yeah, but it's fun. Hmm. Someone comes in at one point, and I think it might be Dave Edmonds himself, maybe, doing the square dance calling. Katie ends it all by saying the next dance will be a circle square. So... I had to look up to find out what the heck a circle square is. It's a circle in square dancing. Okay. It's a ring that's made up of two or more dancers. They join hands and circle as directed to the left or to the right. Uh -huh. If no direction is given, you automatically circle left. Huh, okay. And the square dance caller may or may not tell you to circle a specific amount of times. Huh. which. I think they probably should because what if you're just going and going and you're going? You're going to get dizzy and fall down. Unless they, the caller jumps in and says, okay, or, Alaman left. That's the only thing I can remember from the song. Or maybe he, out of spite, he could just keep you going forever. Until you throw up. Yeah, Dance till you die. Yes. Yeah. This song comes at you at 100 miles an hour, and it's a hard song to resist. If you're not even at least tapping a foot to this, check your pulse because you may be dead. Agreed. Next track, High Time for a Detour. This song is vocally impressive. First of all, the background singer, is that Katie or somebody else? Um, it 
could be her. Okay, whoever it is, they have an insanely high register. I think I heard her hit a high E above high C, which is Christine Daae's highest note in Phantom of the Opera. Anyway, if this song didn't make you marvel at Katie's vocals... If the last song didn't make you marvel at Katie's vocals, then this one will, because of how she's able to vocally slide down into her lowest register one minute, and then do an Elvis impression the next, and concluding with some high notes in her head voice at the end. The opening is enough to prove she should have been more famous than she is, but this track confirms it. And this was where the musicianship of her band really came through, because they're able to sustain some really interesting arrangements here without ruining the vibe. Interesting stuff here musically, but not as rip-roaring as the opening. I wish I was still riding that wave. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have to. Admit, I have no idea what this song is about. There seems to be some sort of duck hunting metaphor in here somewhere. Um, I just kind of got lost in the reach trying to find the ducks. But, mm -hmm. you know, I'm going to go Dick Clark here. American Bandstand and say it's got a good beat and you can dance to it. Amen. Not in case of case, but not this time. <laughs> Next track. Diet of Strange Places. This is an I Want song if I ever heard it. In musical theater terminology, listeners, the I Want song is the track that informs us of a character's hopes and dreams so we can root for them. The most famous example is Part of Your World from The Little Mermaid. Katie has a deep longing within. You could go literal on this and wonder if she's a cannibal, or see this as her country bumpkin wants to move to the big city song. Her craving to experience new people and new ideas wears her thin, and she just can't seem to get enough. So until that day comes where she's sated, she'll meet new people and absorb their loneliness like a vampire. What a dark thought. Mm. But sung so tunefully with some fun vocal slides. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. um, the idea for this song, believe it or not, came to Katie when she and the Reclines were playing a Playboy club <gasps> in Japan. Oh, no. It was just so disorienting and it just seemed all so out of place That's, to her. That sounds bonkers. <laughs> it does. Um, it was just very disorienting, no pun intended. Um, and it's kind of like her, her being like the misfit trying to fit in anywhere. It was just so freaky deaky. Because they probably had, did they have the bunnies over there, I'm assuming? Probably. It was in the 80s, so that was probably still going strong. Yeah, Hugh Hefner was still, you know. Next mm -hmm. track. Got but the, a nice, a yep, nice ballad, sorry. though. Yep, got the bull by the horns. Okay, hear me out. Okay. This song, musically, starts out similar to One Way or Another by Blondie. Can you hear it? I can kind of hear it, yeah. yeah. This was a track where in headphones, I don't think it was mixed that well because I could barely hear Katie's voice. It feels like a country song at a dive bar, although for a brief moment there was an accordion, so we were in Polkaville for a little bit, but we'll get to Polka later. The song is generic. Katie loves all the ladies and isn't going to lose on love again and is going to be with everyone, which good for her knowing what she wants. This was the time I was underwhelmed, and again, I think it's because the music drowns out her voice. For a brief moment, she pulled me back in with her Elvis impression, but that was about it. Generic and unmemorable except for one moment. moment. And as for Johnny Horton, it's pretty generic country, too. Hmm. Yeah, this was originally recorded by Johnny Horton in 1958. His most famous song is... Uh... The Battle of New Orleans, as in 1814, we took a little trip along with Colonel Jackson down the mighty Mississippi. Mm -hmm. All right, Katie, not. Um, his version clocks in at less than two minutes, yeah. and Katie's is a little over three. And the thing is, with Johnny Horton, I found a couple of different versions. Oh, okay. There was some that were a lot more um, um, built up. They had, like, uh, background vocalists, more instruments, where... Uh, the one I sent you was from the essential Johnny Horton. I yes. thought, well, this is probably the original stripped down, so let's go with the that. The official, official version. Yep. So Katie's version is a little over three minutes. And yeah, she loves the brunettes, blondes, redheads. Don't we all? Mm -hmm. uh, since you don't know when. But she was slow to get things going. She did okay in school. Everyone hung around her, but she was too shy to make a move. But now she's never going to do that again. She got the bull by the horns and the downhill drag, which... I spent so much time looking up rodeo terms, just trying to see what the heck does that mean. And I'm assuming it's like, it's like you know, you're roping them and then you have to like pull them down on the ground. I don't know if you have to like hold them down on the ground for so long. Mm -hmm. I have no idea. Mm -hmm. Anyone out there who can enlighten us? Please do. Much appreciated. Next track, Watch Your Step Polka. No, you watch your step polka. 
first line, first line in my notes, that piano player is awesome. Mm -hmm. I guess they really went for the Polish and polka by having someone who sounded like Chopin on the keys. There really aren't any words to this except for the title, yeah. which is interesting because there are a ton of polka songs with lyrics. But this is the album's dance track, and Katie really doesn't do a lot. It could have just been an instrumental easily, but I do like how they sing the title track here, particularly with how they hiss the letter S. Now, as for me, when I hear a polka, my first thought is, would Judge have liked this? Because the man was a hardcore polka fan. If there was an aesthetic, aesthetic for polka the way there is for punk rock and metal, he would have worn it. It's probably just Polish clothes, but anyway. I think he might have found this polka a bit too fast, but I think he'd find the music interesting and give it a solid, not bad, and that's what I'd give this to. If they had more of that piano player showing off, then I would have really marveled, but alas, not. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like you said, all this song's lyrics are in the title. So, it, yeah, it's definitely more of an instrumental, if you will. And it comes at you fast, definitely cowpunk speed. I cannot imagine anyone dancing to this, especially the polka. Mm -hmm. But I could be wrong. I actually went on YouTube and for the longest time searched very fast polka music with dancing. Mm -hmm. And a lot of stuff came up, but not at this speed. You had old people, you had little kids dressed up in Polish costumes. It was just, there's a lot of polka on um, on YouTube. Maybe that's why it's called the Watch Your Step Polka, because no one can dance to it and everyone's going to be falling over. Yeah, you'd probably be tripping over your own feet. Yeah. Um, yeah, if, if there were people dancing this fast to this, they'd be passed out people everywhere. Definitely not the type of polka you'd see on the old Lawrence Welk show. No. And definitely not the type that... Nanny and Grandpa would have danced too. He wouldn't be able to do the one in the tuba to this at all. No, definitely not. Mm -hmm. Be more like a Ramones. What do they for? <laughs> That'd be hilarious to see the Ramones on the Lawrence Welk show. Oh man. Anyway, next track, Rose Garden. Okay, is I never promised you Rose Garden a famous line outside of this? Well, it was also a book. It was a um, um a, an autobiography, I believe. Is it a good book? I haven't read it. Okay. I feel like I've heard it before. Maybe it's from that. This is Katie's beautiful way of saying, I never promised things would be perfect, but let's savor the good times and get through the bad times together. And I almost loved this song. If it weren't for that darn key change where it gets all happy and rosy again. Darker keys in music are much more <laughs> interesting. Yeah. I did appreciate the rhyme, let's be jolly, life shouldn't be so melancholy, which I had an interesting thought. We don't really hear the word jolly anymore with the exception of the Christmas season. Yeah. It's an older adjective that could easily come across as hokey or saccharine, but the clever rhyme makes it work here. Almost perfect. My personal preference is leave it in the key it started out in. As for Lynn Anderson, the opening with the strings is jarring and beautiful, but her voice doesn't wor really work. Katie's vocals are better. Hmm. Getting back to the word jolly. Mm -hmm. When I was a kid, there was a place up the street. Um, you know where the market basket is? Yeah. Yeah. That used to be an amusement park club. Jolly Chollies, C H O L L Y. Nana probably knows all about that. Yeah, well, I, I we got to go there a few times. Was it any fun? It was okay. It wasn't. It wasn't Crescent Park or Rocky Point, but no, eh, it wasn't bad. It was definitely more for like little kids. Ah, okay. Yeah. Okay, so Rose Garden was written by underrated songwriter Joe South in 1967. Billy Joe Royal first recorded it, then Joe South himself, and then Dobie Gray. In 1970, Linda Anderson heard Joe South's version and wanted to record it. Her husband, producer Glenn Sutton, thought it was more of a guy song because of the line about promising diamond rings. Mm -hmm. uh, but Lynn kept after him and after him, and they recorded it. But it wasn't intended to be released as a single. But Columbia president Clive Davis heard it and said that this was Lynn's next single. It was going to be big. Was it? Well, it came out in October 1970. Hit number one on the Billboard Country Chart, and then crossed over into the top 40, landing at number three. Whoa, okay. Which was very unusual for country, country music at that time to make mm -hmm. that kind of a crossover. It became Lynn Anderson's biggest hit and her signature song. KD's version blew up big in Canada. But again, it was pointed out how Dave Edmonds' production buried her voice. Yeah. I disagree. Maybe it's just me, but I can hear her fine. No, the, the, what was the track that I mentioned where her voice got buried? Uh, na, 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 na. Bull by the Horns? Died of Strange Places? 
uh, yeah, Bull by the Horns. That was the one where I really couldn't hear her. Uh, I, maybe maybe it's me. Maybe, maybe, maybe it's just because it. yeah, because yeah. I've been listening to this since 1987. This is 36. Oh my god, 36 years, 37 years, 30 something, 36, three, two, yeah, 36 years. Holy crap. Yeah, so I'm um, I'm used to it. Um, now, um, as to whether. KD did this version straight, no pun intended, or with a wink. Mm-hmm. Who knows? Whichever one but she wants to do, she'll do it. Her version is right up there with Lynn's. Mm-hmm. And I think the song is about the singer not wanting to make false promises. It's not always going to be sunshine and unicorns. Mm-hmm. Uh, no relationship is. Sunshine, lollipops, and rainbows. Unicorns. <laughs> <laughs> she's, she's being a realist about it. You know, I could sing you a tune and promise you the moon, but if that's what it takes to hold you, I'd just as soon let you go, because, you know... You're, you're, you're asking for too much. Yeah, you can't put me on a pedestal, because I'm going to screw up and fall off, and then we're out of here. Like in that DS9 episode where Bashir fell in love with Serena, and he just wanted too much, and she eventually ended up reverting to her previous mental state. Oh, yeah. Just when she was coming out, and it was like, holy crap. Yep. Watch that. That episode is heartbreaking. Now, uh, random fact... In 1976, Charles Shields came out with I Never Promised You an Apple Orchard, the collected writings of Snoopy, which is still available for sale online at very reasonable prices. It's a hardcover. Is it a written book or is it a comics compilation? It's both. It's like a collection of like a a lot of um, Snoopy's writings that he did in the comic strip. Like he writes these like ridiculous stories Mm -hmm. and then like. Lucy or Charlie Brown will comment on him and, you know, he'll give him the Woodstock to try and stick him in the mailbox. But um, Charles Schultz dedicated the book to the author who wrote the book, I Never Promised You a Rose Garden, which was, I'm pretty sure it was a memoir. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I should have done a little more research on, you know, on my end, but. And they didn't mention Snoopy's Nightmare in that book? No, no. Thankfully, they did not. That would have been horrible. No. The poor kids. No. Okay, next track. Tune into my wave. Okay, the guitar here sounded like a 2000s pop group, and I couldn't think of which one. Maybe in terms of artist vitamin C, with to put a smile on your face, or for going older, like a guitar straight out of the bangles. You mean the one that goes... Mm-hmm. 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 Yeah. You can hear it? Yeah, yeah. yeah I, get, I get where you're coming from. Once again, Katie's voice really stands out because of how she's able to sustain a note at a loud volume, which, wow. And she goes into her higher register here briefly, which is always fun because she knows when to use it. The background singers make the title lyric catchy. Katie says, forget everything and tune into me on your CB radio, which is a little thing I love when bands and artists reference themselves by name in their songs. It's the old third person. Yeah, it's very fun as Katie says, I am into you and I will make you into me, darn it. And the fade out really works here too. Very good time. Mm-hmm. But to me, the title sounds like so hippie, hippie-ish, like tune into my wave. Like, man. Like, yeah. like, 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 let's grok, man. But it doesn't sound stupid. Yeah, yeah, it does not sound stupid. And Katie does want this other person to relate to her, but to dial her on her trucker CB, which is... Very 70s. Mm-hmm. I mean, for some reason, that just became really, really popular to the point where someone bought me a deck of cards that had a different CB phrase and cartoon on each card. Oh, cool. And then it told you what it meant. Like, it gave you the lingo, and then it told you what the what the uh, definition really was. That's cool. But yeah, it was like really... Really odd time. Like I said, it was the 70s. The 70s were just very odd. Everyone was smoking crack. That's why. Okay. <laughs> um, not some more 80s, but. Oh, okay. Um, it does get a little hippie-ish with the Timothy Leary line about tuning in or tuning out or dropping in or dropping out or. Uh, I can't remember. Um, I think she just wants this other person to have fun like she's having. And best line, loosen your noose. Mm-hmm. And yeah, she is in fine voice, especially when she holds that first well. Yep, I'm like that holy one. Holy crap! Her lung capacity, my god. Yeah, yep, yep, yep. She can sing. Makes me wonder if she ever played like um, a brass instrument at some point in her life. At one point in time, I couldn't really find anything about that. Like I said, like like she really didn't get into music until she was at the um, 
at uh, Red Deer College, and for that, I think it was more theater at first because mm. then she got into like performance art. Yeah. Um, and yeah, just being exposed to Patsy Cline, that was okay. I think I want to be a singer. Mm. And Son of a Gun, she's got the pipes to back it up. Okay, title track, Angel with a Lariat. God, those background vocals are gorgeous. Mm -hmm. K.D. Lang is in love with a nice, honest country girl and is waiting to be carried to heaven, a.k.a. to bed. And the first thing I noticed was how gorgeous the background singers sound, as I said. Like, the backup singers for a Johnny Cash song, only the sound quality is a lot better than how it used to be back in Johnny's day. Should it be the title track? Yes, because Katie has the voice of an angel and this whole track is country-themed. She's our angel with a lariat. I hope that other girl treats her nice, too. I think the background singers, it's almost like like a version of the Jordanaires who backed up Elvis on almost every single thing he sang. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, this is Katie's tribute to Patsy Cline, the singer who inspired Katie. It's also Katie's epiphany moment. Like I said earlier, she heard Patsy's music since she was going to be portraying her in a play, and the music just really resonated with her. And at one point, Katie even sings, I Feel Emancipation. Like, she found it just so freeing, like, mm -hmm. like I said, you know, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to be this singer, and this is great stuff. Mm -hmm. um, but musically, it's faster than anything I've ever heard Patsy Cline sing. And I have a 22-song best of of hers, and not one of those songs is even this fast. Mm. But it's a, it's a great tribute. It really, really is. Next track, Pay Dirt. I bet this describes the lives of a lot of people who are looking to get rich during the gold rush in the U.S., and again, the way they sing the title track with all those voices layering on top of each other is beautiful to the ears. And I was still stuck on Dave Stewart, so I said, part of it sounds Annie Lennox-esque. I can kind of see that. But you can tell it's KD all the way through, and that's really all I have to say here. Okay, uh, the Oxford Dictionary defines pay dirt as ground containing ore in sufficient quantity to be profitable extracted. Mm -hmm. Like, it's definitely worth the work that you're going to put in to what you're going to get out of it. Mm -hmm. um, Katie sings about people who want the easy way out, looking for that big strike so they don't have to work. They're panning in rivers, sifting sand, mm -hmm. digging in the ground, which, when you think about it, those are all different types of labor, actually. Yeah. Um, but they're just looking for, like, short-term work for that big strike if they're lucky. Mm -hmm. And... Um, there are those who won't fall in love unless the one day's courting got more than enough. So gold diggers are looking for their sugar daddy or sugar mama. And as they say, if you marry for money, you will earn every single penny. Yep. But you know what the other trick is, though? What? Outliving the spouse helps, too. Yeah, it does. Yeah. Final track, Three Cigarettes in an Ashtray. And now we have a tonal shift as the album comes to a close with a sad romantic ballad. Man, if you were having a great day before listening to this song, your mood is about to take a nosedive. KD is pouring everything into this, and wow. Her idiot man left her for another woman, and KD just watches her one lone cigarette burn away. This is a song that can only be described as depression. Your love has left you and you have no energy to do anything but stare at that stupid cigarette and relive it all. Great gut punch to end on. As for Patsy Cline, vocally she reminds me a lot of Peggy Lee because their voices are so similar and I thought I was hearing Peggy Lee singing this for a second. Those opening vocals on her version sounded like Weird Al's One More Minute. <laughs> and, <laughs> oh my god, yes. I'm right, yeah. And Patsy is more dejected and resigned, but KD's sounds fresh as if she just lost this person. Yeah. yeah. Um, when Patsy Cline sang uh, some of the songs she was recording, she felt them so much that she was actually crying while she sang them. Aww. And if you listen very, very closely to some of her, it. you can yep. hear it. Yep. Aww. So, yeah, three cigarettes and an ashtray. You know, and now after nine stopper stompers, we slam on the brakes. Yeah, and we're like, really, whoa. really hard. Whiplash. Yep, this is a Patsy Cline song if there ever was. Now she recorded it in 1957, and it was released after her first hit, "Walking After Midnight," but it wasn't as successful, even though it got critical raves. I think everyone was expecting "Walking After Midnight" part two. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, without giving too much away, first there's two cigarettes. And there's three, and then there's one. This was back back when everyone smoked. 
back then. Because you know why? Because back then it was good for you. And everybody was promoting it on TV. Look at Lucille Ball and Desi Arnaz promoting Philip Morris cigarettes. Yep. And then um, I don't know if you remember when we go into um, Mr. M- Mrs. Bartley's Burgers, there's that ad on the wall of Ronald Reagan back when he's an actor. He's got the cigarette in his mouth. Mm-hmm. And he's saying, I'm giving everyone Chesterfields for Christmas. And he's got like those 10-pack boxes. And he's just like writing names of like, you know, to such whoever and such from Ron. To Alexander Haig. No, you are not the president. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, have some more cigarettes. I have a theory about cigarettes. So you know how in the old movies, if, if, if they did have a love scene, which was very rare uh, post Hayes Code, but people would always smoke cigarettes after sex? Mm-hmm. I have a new theory that the, the modern version of this, the contemporary version of this, is scrolling through your phone after sex through videos. Oh, I thought it was so you can compare. No, <laughs> That's, that's not why. <laughs> oh, okay. Anyway, anyway, mm-hmm. Katie belts it out for all she's worth, but not in an overbearing way. No, so no, no, just like, enough. Yeah, and I really think Patsy would have liked this version. And can I say, Katie Lang is a singer. She knows how to use her instrument. Mm-hmm. She knows how with every single one. My complaints about the songs are not with her at all. Well, you have a problem with Dave Edmonds like everyone else, huh? I, I guess. I don't know. I oh, okay, this... you're, you're, you're entitled. Like I said, I, I don't because it's like, I, I know what I'm in for when he's behind the boards. Or also the writing. And, you know, maybe when we get to him and Niccolo, then I'll like him better. But I don't know yet. Okay. Mm-hmm. Overall, Katie Lang deserves to be more famous than she is. I mean, she's very famous in Canada, but she should be more famous worldwide due to the quality of her voice alone. Tony Bennett was right. She is one of the great voices of all time, and she deserves more recognition. Like, he had her up there with Edith Piaf and I think Hank Williams. We gave, like, a list of examples. Mm -hmm. Now, if you want to explore her music, listen to this and listen to her duets with Tony Bennett. You will be amazed at her range as a singer. Just know that if you're not into country music and find the whole genre kind of samey like I do, then this might not be for you. But you'll still be able to appreciate a good singer performing. The one thing I kept reading whilst doing research was that there were kitsch elements to Katie's country music albums and um, that it was performance art. And maybe it was. There was one story I read which I thought was hilarious and it just seemed too good to be true. Like when she was going through a Patsy Cline phase, mm-hmm. she put the, the letters for Patsy on, it was like a t-shirt or a sweater. Yeah, pressed on. Mm-hmm. But she misspelled it and it came out pasty. Oh, Katie. Yeah. Whoops. So, you know, maybe there's something to that criticism, but you know what? For me, it's a hell of a lot more fun than some of the stuff she recorded after she stopped doing her version of C&W. Because um, I borrowed Recollection from the library, which, um, like I said, there was a one-disc and a two-disc version of like her solo stuff post-reclines. Mm-hmm. And I got the two-disc version because that was the one that they had available. Mm-hmm. And it's, well, I hate to use this word. Uh-oh. For, for me, anyway. Okay. Boring. Oh. Now, don't get me wrong. Her voice still sounds great. But it's again, our critiques are not with her. It's with everything else around her. But it was like, 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 this two disc set was extremely heavy on covers, mm-hmm. um, and all the songs were slow or verging on slow. There was kind of like uh, a samey quality to them. You don't want plotting. Because I was really. I was really, really waiting for her to cut loose. I was thinking, it's going to be the next song. It's going to be the next You're song. You're having your Tyra Banks moment. I was rooting for you. We were all rooting for you. It's going to be the next disc. It's not going to be the next disc. And I thought, oh, man, she's got this great voice. And I thought, you know you know what she needs? What? She needs some Dave Edmonds back in her life. He needs to come out of retirement and kick her in the pants. Or maybe get Nick Lowe if Dave's not available. Yes, I think either. Well, I think I would go with Dave more nowadays. Really? Nick has kind of calmed down. Oh, yeah, and he's doing his touring stuff, too. Yeah, whereas Dave's retired and, and who knows. But um, then, mm-hmm. remember how I talked about that dance remix album, Makeover? Did you listen to it? I thought, I will try this. I ordered it from the library. And? There's 14 tracks. But it's only eight songs. What? Because six of those songs uh-huh. have two different remixes each. Oh, okay. 
And uh, how was it? Ah, uh, holy crap. Oh, no, really? What a great disc. Oh! <laughs> I was all set to be disappointed after slogging through Recollection, but wow, this was so much fun. This is like, it, it, it's automatically already one of my favorite discs that I will play during the summer. Oh, cool. It's okay. just so, um, there's not one boring track, even though six of those songs are repeated twice, but the, the remixes are different. Mm -hmm. And it's like, like, wait a minute. Okay, I recognize those words from another song, but this sounds so different. It was just so much fun, just so summery, just so carefree. I will definitely be getting my own copy soon. All right. And the one thing is, um, the album cover itself, I'm looking and I'm thinking, wait a minute, that's Katie Lang. And let me tell you, the, the front cover lives up to the title Makeover. She went for, I believe, what is called the lipstick lesbian look. Oh, that's like, interesting. Holy moly. I, I, I was just, but yeah, I was just mm -hmm. pleasantly surprised. I thought, Katie Lang and dance remixes? No. Believe me, listeners, yes. Who knows? Maybe we'll cover another show one day. So I recommend that. But also, Angel with a Lariat, I recommend wholeheartedly. It is a fun way to spend half an hour. It really, really is. On that note, as always, thank you for listening to the latest installment of My Dad Listens to This. Like, comment, subscribe, and all that jazz. Because remember, the more you interact with the video, the greater a chance we have of appearing on the YouTube homepage. If you follow me on social media, I post the episodes there. If you're friends with my dad, send him an email and he'll shoot an episode right to your inbox. And as always, if you like what we do, leave a little tip in the Ko-Fi tip jar. Thanks for listening to the latest installment of My Dad Listens to This. We'll be back next time with another album to nitpick and gripe about. Dad, anything you want to say before we sign off? Yes. Never confuse Katie Lang with Scottish psychiatrist R.D. Lang. <laughs>